Well, we come this morning to a very well-known passage of Scripture. I remember reading this as a new believer in the summer of 95, um, summer before my sophomore year in high school. I had just gotten saved, started reading through the book of Matthew, came to this section, and I remember it provoking a sense of wonder, but then also some discomfort, even some fear. Then I, a few years later, my first few years in ministry, I remember this passage was a source of arguments and debates with uh, people that I was, I was working with, trying to figure out what exactly Jesus meant. It actually led to some division. I've heard this passage used in evangelistic messages. I've, used it, I've heard it used um, in, as a road to heresy. I've heard it used in a form of manipulative preaching. But more recently for me, the passage that we come to today has been a source of comfort and encouragement. So we're in Matthew chapter 13, and we'll be working through what is called the parable of the sower. And right at the onset, I'm going to warn you that we're at a little bit of a disadvantage. Almost every time I've heard this passage preached, the preacher looks at just this section, just the parable by itself, and that's it. That's the sermon. And they're done and then they move on to something else. But in order to best understand the parable of the sower, we need to see it in context of everything that happens in chapter 13. And in chapter 13, you have three sections of teachings that Jesus gives. And in those three teachings, there are seven parables. And while each one is different, there is a common thread going through them all. And so it's best to see the, the part in light of the whole. But at the same time, chapter 13 is long. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, there's, there's, gosh, 53, no, no, 58 verses. And each one is a long sentence. I mean, there is so much here to get through. And so I don't want to miss out on some of the specifics either. And so we'll try to, to walk a, a tightrope of not getting so caught up in the little bit that we miss the whole, but not getting so caught up in the whole that we miss the little bit. So even though I do think it's better to keep verses 1 to 52 together, we're not. I'm going to do what I've heard preachers do countless times and just look at just the parable. But hopefully I'll, I'll bring in the other stuff to shed light on it that will lay the groundwork for the next coming weeks. So let's get into it. We're in Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to start reading verse 1. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced good grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear." So it's helpful to remember right at the outset that the Sea of Galilee is not a sea at all. It's not an ocean. It's just a lake and, and not that big of a one um, at that. When you hear sea, we typically think of, you know, you go down to Galveston for the day or, or a better beach, which most beaches are. Um, you go down to a beach and, and you stand there on the water and it's loud, right? The waves are crashing in and, and you're trying to talk to your friends who are just right there and it's kind of hard to hear. That's not what's happening here with Jesus, right? He leaves the house he's been at and he goes down to the water. And um, again, it's not an ocean, it's a lake. And when I was there this past summer, we went to various spots along the Sea of Galilee and it's calm. Even if there is some, some wind driving up some stuff, you can hear things. And the way that the land is shaped up from the water's edge, uh, you can hear things quite easily. And there have been some people who have done some studies that if you're in certain spots on the water, people can hear you talking up to 100 yards away. 
And that's what's happening here. Um, there, Jesus goes down to the water. These crowds gather around him. How is he going to speak to them all? So he gets in a boat, and there, it's almost like an amphitheater. They can hear him as he speaks. But what he says to them is fascinating. I mean, he tells them a story. He says this, this farmer goes out, and he just, just starts casting his seed. Some of the seed falls along a path, and you know, birds eat it. And, you know, other seed, well, falls along, you know, where the soil is, is a little bit rocky. And, you know, some sprouts spring up, but eventually the sun scorches them. You know, some of the seed, you know, he, he spreads and it gets mixed into the ground where there are thorns. And, and thorns grow up with the seed, and it kind of chokes it out. And, but then there's some where, you know, it, it lands on good soil, and, and grain props up. And it's a, it's a really productive crop, right? And that's it. That's the whole story. He ends it with, he who has ears, let him hear. Now think about everything that Jesus has said so far in the book of Matthew. He's preached about the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God is here. It's coming. It's advancing. Jesus has, has spoke on the meaning of the law and its intent and how the Pharisees and the scribes have been misinterpreting it and misunderstanding it. He talks about the dangers of unrepentance. He teaches about the sovereignty of God. And here, he has this huge crowd around him, but this time it's different. This time he's not healing their diseases. This time he's not casting out demons. This time he tells them a story. But he doesn't even share the, mor share the, the moral of the story. He, he doesn't say, okay, now here's what I'm saying. Now, here's what you need to learn from this, right? Here's a story. Uh, here's the main idea, an anecdote to go with it. Nope. He just shares something like a, a page out of a farmer's journal. And I imagine that the people there that day heard him, and they kind of looked around and said, what? And I get that from verse 10, because his disciples come up to him as he's saying these things, and they're like, um, Jesus. I, I, in my mind, they're whispering it out of the side of their mouth there on the boat with him. And they're like, oh. Well, what are, you, what are you doing? Look at it, verse 10. The disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? The word parable is just a story. Well, why are you telling them stories? Get to the teaching, right? That's what you're here to do. You're the proclaimer of the kingdom of God. You're the teacher who knows the scriptures better than anyone else. Why aren't you teaching? What is this story? Now, if you're familiar with the passage, you know that Jesus is teaching. And if you know the explanation, you know what's coming. But I don't want to jump there yet. I want us to take this in as if we were his disciples there that day. Hearing things progress just, just as normal. Try to act like you've never heard the explanation before. You're a disciple there that day. You've heard this man Jesus speak many times. And you believe he is the promised Messiah. The Christ, right? The anointed one who is coming to uh, uh, usher in the kingdom of God and rule in righteousness. And, and you believe this so much, you've left everything. You've left your family and you've left your jobs to follow him because you believe he has the words of life. You've witnessed his miracles as you travel the country. You've witnessed his healings and you believe he alone has these eternal words. And now here he is again. Great opportunity. Crowds have gathered around him. He's going to teach and he tells this story about a farmer. Why? Let's look at it, verse 10. Then his disciples came to him and said, why are you speaking to them in parables? And he answered them and said, well, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Did you catch that? The disciples come, Jesus, why are, you, why are you telling stories? Why are you speaking to them in parables? And he answers, because they don't get to know what you know. You're already in, and so I'm going to explain the mysteries of the kingdom to you. But they're not in, and they're not going to understand what I'm saying. Now, I like the word mysteries in verse 11. 
uh, mysteries of the kingdom rather than secrets. It, it's the Greek word mysterion and, and other translations translated as mysteries, not secrets. And I'll explain why I think that fits better in a moment. But first, just imagine hearing this from Jesus. I'm speaking to them in stories because they don't get to know what you know, disciples. This is one of the reasons I read this with wonder and fear as a new Christian. Why don't these crowds get to know? Why are they being left out? Why don't they get to know the mysteries of the kingdom? Why don't they get to know the truth of Jesus? And Jesus says why. He says, they're looking at me with their physical eyes, but they don't have a clue as to what they're seeing. And they're they're listening as the sound waves come into their ears, but, but they're not hearing what I'm saying. Their brains are, are putting together the images of farming that I'm putting out there, but they're not understanding. And objections may spring up in your heart. You say, well, wait a second, Jesus. You're the teacher. It's your job to help them understand, right? Right? I mean, it's your job to open up the eyes of the blind. It's your job to open up the ears of the deaf. It's your job to give understanding when their brains aren't getting it. Maybe if you would teach more rather than just telling this farming story, maybe if you just spoke plainly, they would get it. Why don't you go back up there and try again, right? And maybe that's, maybe that's what I'm thinking as a disciple in the boat. I don't know about you, right? Why are you telling the story? But Jesus isn't done with his explanation yet. Look at verse 14. Indeed, in their case, that this is the crowds, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand. And you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes... They have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Why don't these crowds get to know the truth? It's because their hearts are hard and they refuse to accept it, just like Isaiah the prophet said they would several hundred years before. And this is why I prefer the word mysteries of the kingdom rather than secrets. It's not like Jesus had a secret, like, oh, only us in the club get to know. That's not what he's intending here. Instead, what Jesus tells his disciples is that prophets and righteous children of God throughout the centuries long to see what you're getting to see right now. They knew that God had a plan of salvation. They knew some of the aspects of it, but they didn't really know the specifics. They didn't know what it would look like. They knew a Messiah was coming who would redeem Israel, but they didn't know all that it entailed. They knew God's servant would come and save people from their sins, but, but they didn't have all the details. It was a mystery. And in the Bible, the word mystery doesn't mean riddle like it does today. It meant something that was previously hidden but now has been revealed. It's revealed at a time of God's choosing. And so the prophets and saints knew something was coming and they longed to know exactly what it would be. They had faith that he would do it. But they just didn't know when or how. Now here's the thing. Remember in Isaiah's day, Isaiah was given an impossible mission. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, right? The train of his robe fills the temple with glory. And remember Isaiah's like, "Uh uh-oh, I'm undone, man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And God heals him, right? God um, uh, cleanses his sin. And and then you hear God saying, who am I going to send? Who's going to go out for us? And Isaiah, famous verse says, here I am, send me. And what does God say? He says, okay, Isaiah, I'm sending you out as a preacher. But guess what? Your ministry will be abysmal in the world's eyes because people are going to hear you and they will not believe. I'm sending you out to people who will see you, but they won't understand a thing about what you're saying. They're going to have hard hearts that refuse to see and hear, but I'm sending you out to them anyways. 
So in his own day, Isaiah knew people are going to hear me, they're just not going to believe. And then he prophesied, when the Messiah comes, it's going to be the same way. And so Jesus is explaining to his disciples, hey, this mystery is being revealed. The the time of of being hidden is gone. It's time to open things up. But they're not going to believe it. You do. You've received me, but they won't. Now catch this. Jesus goes directly from, here's why I told them this story, to explaining the story. He's like, I want you disciples to understand it. So look at verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what's been sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures for a little while when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and it yields in one case a hundredfold, another sixty, and in another thirty. So now it's coming together. The seed is the word of the kingdom. It's the gospel. So whenever someone shares the gospel, it's as if it's a seed has been planted in their heart. And so some people hear, but their hearts are, it's like, like a heart, like a path, right? There's... They're not getting it. And so it's gone. Other people hear and they joyfully accept it. They're like, I believe. But then whenever persecution comes, it's gone. I don't believe anymore. Other people hear it and believe, but they end up loving the world and money more than Jesus. The seed is gone. And then finally, others hear and believe and they're fruitful. Now again, put yourself there on the boat. You're hearing Jesus say these things. You're hearing this explanation. What are you thinking? For me, I have three questions that spring up in my mind when I hear this explanation from Jesus. Three questions. The first is this. Why did he tell this farmer story to the crowds that were gathered around him? I mean, it's one thing to give someone a story with a moral in it, knowing that they may not understand. You know, if you have a a three-year-old just learning to really form sentences and stuff, and and you may tell them the story of the little boy who cried wolf, right? And you know they may not really understand it, but you're hoping that they'll get enough or at least become familiar with it so that the next time they're tempted to lie, they'll remember the little boy who cried wolf, and, and they won't lie. But Jesus' parable about this farmer, we read that he already knows they will not understand. But let's pretend that they could. What would the takeaway for them be? What is it, what would the moral of the story be? What does he want them to do? What does he want them to know? And so you could perhaps say, don't let persecution shake your faith. Right? There are some who spring up with joy until persecution comes, so watch out for persecution. It could be, watch out for the dangers of riches, right? Some seeds spring up and, and the riches uh, choke it out and, and so they, they abandon the gospel. I mean, it could be, and both of those things are true, but, but here's the thing. Jesus has already said both of those things plainly to the people that are listening. He's already said things like, Blessed are you when you are persecuted and and people utter all uh, false things against you on my account. You're blessed. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven, right? He's already talked about persecution plainly. And he's already talked about the dangers of money. He says you cannot serve both God and wealth. And he said that plainly. And so if he's already said these things plainly, why give them discreetly here? And so even though they're true, are those things meant to be the moral of the story? Is that why he told this crowd about the farmer? Is it just expect persecution and watch out for riches? I'm going to argue no, that that's not the purpose of the story. 
And the reason for that is simple. Jesus already said, I'm telling them this because I know they're not going to understand. But if they wouldn't understand, why tell it? That's my first question. It might be helpful to take a a quick step back, if possible, and ask, who's in this crowd that Jesus is talking to? Back up to verse 1, we see that same day Jesus went out of the house. So that alerts us. What same day? What house is he in? What's going on? What's the context? And so we go to chapter 12, and here's the flow of what happened. Remember, Jesus had cast a demon out of a man who was mute and, uh, and, and uh, was a mute and deaf. Um, Jesus cast out the, uh, this demon, and the demon's gone. Pfft, successful exorcism. Uh, and what happens? The Pharisees see this, and they believe Jesus is demonic himself. They, they say, well, it's by the power of Beelzebul that you do this. You're using demonic power, right? So then what do the, the Pharisees do in response? They say, okay, if you're really who you say you are, show us a sign. And Jesus responds by telling them that an evil generation asks for a sign. He knows that even if he were to do something incredible, they wouldn't believe it. How? How does he know that? Because he just did an exorcism and they didn't believe it. Just a few verses earlier, he heals a man who is crippled. And he healed him and they still didn't believe it. So he knows that when they come saying, show us a sign, they don't really want a sign. There is no sign that would suffice. And then while he's discussing that with the Pharisees at the end of chapter 12, Jesus' family show up, his mothers and brothers, sisters, and they can't get into the house where he's talking, and so they send word like, hey, let us in. We're here to see you. And he says, essentially, in order to be my family, we don't just have to be blood-related. No, instead you have to do God's will. It's only the people who do God's will. That's my family. And so what is God's will? You believe that I am uh, who I am. You repent and you follow me, which, which indicates his family wasn't there yet. And so what you have in chapter two is these successive groups of unbelievers interacting with Jesus. They're seeing the signs, but they don't believe. They're hearing him teach, but they don't believe. Then he leaves the house and goes to the water's edge and people show up. And so these crowds are not genuine seekers of the truth. These crowds are not following Jesus because they heard and believed. They're not following Jesus because they want to learn. They're not even drawn to him as a miracle worker. They had heard his teaching but not believed. They saw his miracles and thought he was demonic. These are people, this crowd is a group who is set on rejecting Jesus. And so back to my question. If that's the case, why tell the parable of the sower to them at all? If these are really the people who have gathered around Jesus, why say, "Ah, a farmer went out and threw some seeds and not tell them what it means? This parable isn't for the crowd. It's for the disciples. Which leads to my second question. He's speaking to the crowds, but but we know he's really talking to his disciples. And so here's my second question. If that's true, what is it he wants the disciples to learn? What does Jesus want them to know and do? And again, we could answer the same thing, right? Well, he wants them to know that persecution's coming and to be ready for it. And he wants them to avoid the trappings of wealth and riches. But, but just like before, he's already said those things plainly. They've already heard these things. So here's what I think Jesus is doing. Remember that chapter 12 is a turning point in the book of Matthew. Not only is there this this trail of unbelief in chapter 12, but there's also, including some of his own family, but there's more outright opposition. It's in chapter 12 that we see, for the first time, the Pharisees don't just disagree with Jesus, they want to destroy him. They want him dead. And Jesus, with this story, is helping the disciples understand why. Why haven't these people believed? Why don't they get it? Why are these Pharisees so mad? 
Is it because Jesus wasn't using the right words? Was he being too argumentative? And the main idea Jesus is getting across is no. Their unbelief is not because Jesus was making preaching mistakes. Because he didn't make any. But that's not the only reason. Jesus is also laying the groundwork for the disciples to be sowers themselves. They too will, will share the gospel of the kingdom like a farmer who's spreading seed. And, and he's prepping them that they must speak, but sometimes it's going to fall on deaf ears. And it's not their fault. Some people will listen, but they won't hear. And it's not the gospel's fault. It's not like the gospel, the words of the kingdom weren't good enough. Some people will hear it and they're joyfully going to receive it until persecution comes and then they're going to fall away and it's not the disciples' fault. Some people will have an initial belief but then abandon it for the sake of money and it's not the gospel's fault. Some people will hear the disciples preaching and believe and follow Jesus and live fruitful, uh, fruitful lives. And so what we find in this farming story is, is, catch this, it's to help the disciples sleep better at night. As Jesus preaches, and as they will preach after he's gone, the things that Jesus is doing with these parables is designed to protect the disciples from falling into one of two errors, both of which bring anxiety and can keep you up at night. Error one, that God is unwilling to save these hearers. Jesus is the sower. He's spreading the seed everywhere, even on those with hard hearts. He doesn't allow the disciples or us to say, well, gosh, you have all these people. They wanted to be saved. I mean, they're flocking around him, and, and they wanted to be saved but couldn't because God didn't choose them. These people, these people did not want to believe. Right? He's not letting us fall into the error of God was unwilling to save them. No, these people did not want to be saved. They did not want to follow him, and so God gave them one day, uh, over to what they wanted. They wanted to be blind, so he let them be blind. They wanted to... To be deaf, so he let them be deaf. But it's not because Jesus wasn't willing to save them. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to life in repentance. At the same time, here's error two. Jesus does not want them to think that God is unable to save these people. Jesus the sower is not helpless when he preaches the good news of the kingdom. The, the apostles shouldn't watch Jesus as he's teaching and think, oh, man, poor guy. I mean, all he wants to do is save these, these poor people, but gosh, he just can't overcome their stubborn hearts. Man. No, God's word is always effective and it always accomplishes what it set out to do. And so bound up in the story about a farmer, Jesus is laying out to his disciples so they don't stay up at night wondering, like, well, gosh, I'm giving everything up to follow Jesus and preach the good news. Why aren't people being saved? If God is, is it because God is unwilling to help me? Is it because God is unable to help me? Do I need to change my strategy? Do I need to change something about the message to make them understand? And, and Jesus says, no, 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 no. Follow my example as the sower. Be a farmer like me. You can't control the results, but you can control where you cast the seed and you cast it everywhere. And who has the results? God does. God determines the results. You just cast the seed everywhere. My final question about this passage this morning is why does Matthew include this story in his gospel? Or maybe better, why does, God, why does Matthew include the explanation in this story? Jesus tells this parable to the crowds without explanation. He never tells them what he means by it. He just, the farmer goes out, does this. Does not explain what he means. But then he gives the explanation to his disciples. Why? Because he wants them to have boldness and comfort when they're preaching the gospel and when they're witnessing and not to worry too much about the results. But Matthew didn't have to write down the explanation. I mean, Jesus says, hey, apostles, I'm letting you in on the secret. I'm helping you understand the mystery because you're following me. You get it, right? But it's not for everyone to know. But if Jesus tells the disciples it's not for everyone to know, why does Matthew, a disciple, include that explanation for everyone to know? That's my question. Why? 
It's because of this. As disciples, as followers of Jesus today, 2,000 years later, we need to learn the same lesson that the disciples back then needed to learn. God is able and willing to save people. And it's our job as his followers to be sowers in the kingdom. We are to be sowers indiscriminately, knowing that sometimes it's going to fall on deaf ears. We don't get to say, well, pff, God just hasn't chosen them, so I'm not even going to speak to them. We don't get to say that. Our job is to cast the seed everywhere. We need to be encouraged like those disciples were. Because it's hard when, when you hear the gospel and it, the light goes off and it makes sense. And you're like, this is so great. This is so, like, this is amazing. And then you start talking with your family and they don't get it at all. Or, or you're sharing the gospel with someone at work and they're like, yes, that's me. Maybe you're doing a Bible study. Maybe you're just sharing the, the gospel one-on-one. -on -one and, and they respond positively and they're like, yes, I get it. I'm in. I'm in. I believe. But then they get that email from HR talking about, hey, this is a warning. You're not allowed to call sin, sin. Right? And if you do, you could be fired. And, and that person who said they believed now shrivels up in fear thinking, well, I, I, I can't lose my job. I mean, Jesus is good and stuff, but I can't, I mean, I got to provide for my family, right? It's frustrating when you see in Jesus a treasure worth giving everything up for, but the people around you here and are more attracted to the fleeting, glittering riches of the world. And they call themselves believers. They may even come to church. But their lives are really about money and riches and stuff. And they have no real thought for the kingdom at all. How do we, as followers of Jesus, remain steady and encouraged in the face of those frustrations? How do we do that? When we're left wondering, why, why don't they get it? When we're tempted to wonder, God, why aren't you working in them? This parable is designed for believers to keep going, to encourage us to keep going, to, to keep sowing the seed everywhere, to keep sharing the gospel. Now, there's more coming, and we're going to get to those in the coming weeks. But for now, we need to be encouraged to share the good news of the kingdom and to expect frustrations when we do. Because sometimes you're going to share, and people just aren't going to get it. And you're like, it makes sense. It's one plus one is two. Why don't you get that? And they're like, I, I, you're, that's advanced algebra. I can't understand <laughs> Or we share the gospel and, and they believe until it gets hard and they give up. And you're like, why are you giving up? This is worth it. Or you see them and, and you're talking and, and again, maybe even like your small group and, and you're talking with them and you see they just have no real concern for the, the, the gospel, the kingdom at all, but, but they can't wait to show you their, their pictures of their vacation home, right? And you're like, well, why don't you care about this as much as that? What's going to keep us going in those frustrations? It's knowing God has a plan to save his people and he uses us to cast the seeds to do it. There may be some, though, who are here and you're not a disciple. And, and when I read the story earlier, you're like, yeah, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> But maybe this morning in talking about who Jesus is as the Messiah, the, the one who came and lived and died and rose again so that we could have our sins taken care of. You hear maybe for the first time, you're like, I get it now. It makes sense. Well, the call on you is to believe and follow Jesus. And then you get to understand all the beauty and glories of what it means to know him and his messages. So let's be encouraged. Again, we have more coming up, but let's be encouraged by this parable of the sower, that Jesus is a good sower who's sowing his seed through us, and I'm going to pray that it, we will be fruitful as we share. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that with the mystery of the gospel, you have not left us to ourselves, but you have opened our minds and our, our eyes and our ears to understand this beautiful mystery that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. 
in that while we were his enemies, you loved us. And while we were against you, dead set against you, 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 Jesus, died and rose again so that we could know you as a great treasure. And so I pray that for those who haven't heard and haven't, they, maybe they've listened a bunch of times, but they've never really heard, I pray that you would open their ears right now so that they would believe and call on you and be saved. And for those who do follow you, Father God, I pray that you would encourage us. Encourage us with, your, with, with the knowledge that you are a perfect sower. And your gospel is the perfect message. So I pray you help us not give up. Give us the, the will and the desire to keep sowing and to keep spreading even in the face of opposition. And I pray that you would make it bountiful. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.